Hello, everyone. Today we're going to read chapter 50, 14 points. The innocent, optimistic, sure of itself 19th century didn't actually end in America until the First World War began. The real start of the 20th century came in 1917. No question about it, the war changed things. It changed people. They began to question old ideas that had never been questioned before. Hardly anyone seemed sure of anything, except Woodrow Wilson. He was like an old-time Puritan, convinced of God's grace and very sure of himself. Wilson would do everything possible to lead his nation and the world on a path of righteousness. His father had been a minister. He had the preacher's genes. He spoke eloquently and told the world how to behave. Unfortunately, some people don't like to be told what to do, even if the teller is right. Before the, end, the war ended, Woodrow Wilson came up with 14 points on which the peace was to be used. Wilson didn't believe in revenge. He believed in the power of kindness. He said he wanted peace without victory, without no punishment for the losers. Now that that was a startling statement in a nation that had cheered Ulysses Grant when he called for unconditional surrender. But Woodrow Wilson had grown up in a, the defeated South. He knew about the hatreds that came after a war. He didn't think an enemy needed to be shamed or made poor. He intended, intended to lead the world towards a generous and lasting peace. Wilson's 14 points may have been the most forgiving peace plan ever. Under the 14 points, people all over the world were to determine their own fate by vote. It's called self-determination. Self-determination was to end the old imperialist system that let winning nations grasp foreign colonies. The 14 points also called for free trade, that means no tariffs or tax on foreign goods, an end to secret pacts between nations, those alliances, freedom of the seas, arms reduction, the forming of a world organization, a league of nations. Slide over here, this enormous crowd that gathered to greet Woodrow Wilson when he arrived in Europe for the Versailles Peace Conference. Wow, they're really crowding that car there. Wilson expected the League of Nations to guarantee freedom to all the world's people and keep peace between nations. Leaflets describing the 14 points were dropped all over Germany from those new vehicles that had been used for the first time as instruments of war, wood-framed airplanes. The German people who were tired of the war and close to rebellion read the leaflets, hoped for peace, and soon forced their ruler, the Kaiser, to flee the country. With the war over, Wilson set off to Europe, the first American president ever to do so while in office. He wanted America to lead the world to a just peace. He wanted to be a peacemaker. The European people were wild with admiration for Woodrow Wilson. They greeted him with flowers and cheers and they called him a savior of the world. Too bad he went, say some historians. Others say it would have been worse if he'd stayed home. Everyone agrees. Wilson didn't get what he wanted. Perhaps because of that, the Great War, which was called the War to End Wars, didn't end anything. It turned out to be World War I. Another world war, which was much worse, follows, followed 21 years later. What went wrong? Why didn't Wilson get his just peace? Was it because he was too sure of himself? Or because he didn't worry enough about jealous politicians 
at home and in Europe? Was it the tragedy of his health before he left the presidency? He exhausted himself, lost contact with reality, and became unable to fight for his beliefs. Maybe it was all of those things, and more, too. After four more years of war, many Americans seemed to have stopped caring. Most just wanted to get on with their lives. Some didn't want to be bothered by ideals. Others were disappointed that we hadn't smashed the enemy. Besides, President Wilson's sermons were getting tiresome. France's crafty old premier prime minister, George Clem Clemenceau, who was called the Tiger, said, God gave us Ten Commandments and we broke them. Wilson gave us his 14 points. We shall see. What, what Clemenceau saw was that France did indeed want revenge. Germany had invaded France twice with his memory. In 1870 and 1914, two generations of Frenchmen were dead. The French countryside was devastated. The French wanted protection and repayment for what they had suffered. They in England and Italy wanted and got a hard peace. They were angry with Germany. The peace treaty was signed at a gorgeous royal place called Versailles. Some of Wilson's most important points got thrown out the window at Versailles. Germany was blamed for the whole war and given a huge bill for war cost. The Germans, who had surrendered in part because of their faith in those 14 points, felt betrayed. But the 14th point, which meant the most to Wilson, the League of Nations was saved. He believed that the League would do, would right the wrongs of the old, old world order. And it might have done so if the nation that was now the most important power in the world had joined the League. What nation could that be? American treaties with foreign powers must be agreed to by two thirds of the members of the Senate. A simple majority won't do. At first, most Americans believed in the League of Nations, but there were some strong senators who hated Wilson. Some were Republicans who were anxious to win the next election. They thought that a triumph for Wilson would hurt their party's chances. When Wilson went to Europe, he brought many advisors with him. They were either professors or Democrats. None were prominent Republicans. That wasn't wise or generous of Wilson's part. Some Republican senators began to fight the idea of the League. Many Americans, Democrats as well, worried about America getting involved in Europe's problems. Woodrow Wilson knew that the problems of anyone, any one part of the globe were now the problems of all peoples. America could not hide from world responsibility. So the president decided to do what he did best, explain things to the American people. That had worked for him before, but in those days before radio and TV, it meant getting on a train and giving speeches. Wilson crossed the country. He gave three or four speeches a day, talking about the importance of the League of Nations. It was too much for his health. Wilson had been working hard in Paris, he had been ill and he acted strangely. In Pueblo, Colorado, he was so sick he could not finish his speech. Then he had a stroke. He was never the same again. Those who opposed the League in the Senate were now able to defeat it. The United States did not join the League of Nations. You can imagine how Woodrow Wilson felt. He believed that without a strong League to enforce peace, there might be another war, and that it would be much, much worse than the Great War. What the Germans 
used were toys compared to what would be used in the next war, he said. But we didn't listen. The United States embarked on a period of is isolation. We tried to stay away from the rest of the world and its concerns. We would learn that could no longer be done. Like it or not, the United States was now a world leader. I can predict with absolute certainty that with another generation there would be another world war if the nations of the world do not concert the method by which to prevent it. That was Woodrow Wilson in 1919. And we will see the beginning of World War II. The influenza pandemic. In 1918, a deadly strain of influenza began to spread rapidly. It was an epidemic. No, it was worse than that. It was a pandemic, which means a disease that spreads across many nations. This one went around the globe. It lasted about nine months and worldwide killed about more than 20 million people. That was more than the total deaths during the four years of the Great War. Mysteriously, it struck at about the same time in India, in Russia, in China. No major nation escapes. In the United States, there were more than a half a million victims. In the last week of October in 1918, 2,700 American soldiers died fighting in Europe. That same week, 21,000 Americans died at home of the flu. On one terrible day in Philadelphia, almost a thousand people died. Neither doctors, nor hospitals, nor cemeteries could handle the awful burdens put upon them. In those days, before the discovery of modern medicines, there was little doctors could do. The disease soon departed as mysteriously as it arrived. It left the country exhausted. Wasn't a war trouble enough? Everyone had worked hard supor supporting the war effort. Americans had done astonishing things in factories and on, on the farms. They fed Europe with amazing harvests of grain. They armed the allies. Citizens had given up luxuries and even some necessities to help others. That flu epidemic was the final straw. Soon the new word was being used. It was normalcy. That's what people wanted. They wanted to go back to the old days before the war. But time won't march backward. Here's an image. The influenza pandemic of 1918 killed more than 20 million people worldwide. <laughs>